Hi skiers, I'm Jeff from SkiEssentials.com. Welcome to the very first episode in our new Chairlift Chat speaker series. Uh, essentially, we're going to be interviewing a series of different industry professionals, athletes, stuff like that, anyone that we think is going to tell a really fun story. Um, to kick it off, we're starting with legendary skier Mike Hattrip. Uh, Mike's an awesome guy. If you don't know him, uh, he's a successful competitive mogul skier when he was young, well known for his appearances and his skiing in classic Greg Stump films like Blizzard of Oz, License to Thrill, stuff like that. Uh, he worked for K2 for a long time. He was a product developer uh, and brand, brand guy at, at K2 for a long time. Uh, and now he's the U.S. Alpine product manager for Fisher Skis. Um, so we talk quite a bit about all that stuff and, and a whole bunch of other things too. Um, I'm going to leave timestamps in the description if you want to skip around to different topics. Um, and yeah, I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. Uh, he's a super fun person to talk to and, and really fun to ski with too. Um, so yeah, enjoy and keep an eye out for the next one. Hey Mike, how are you? Awesome, Jeff. How you doing? Good. It's great to see you. Likewise. Uh, before we get started, I know you just had a pretty serious fall on your bike, so just uh, wishing you well and, and hoping that you're healing up well. I know those things Thanks. take a while. Yeah, it was, uh, it was, a, it was a rough one, um, and uh, it's going to take a little bit longer. I, I smashed my kidney pretty bad and broke some ribs, and Ribs are tolerable right now. You know, I can I can sneeze without getting floored, and uh, uh, but the the kidney's still bleeding a little bit, and it'll take a little longer for that to be healed up. Before well, I we're wishing you all the best over here, uh, but it's good to see you and see you smiling and all that good stuff. Yeah, still kicking. <laughs> uh, so I kind of just wanted to start with a little bit of your skiing background um like where where did you grow up mike i grew up in seattle um okay. yeah so i grew up in in seattle and i was uh i was relatively i mean i was not like i was old but i was 11 when i first started and uh, uh you know i was a typical weekend warrior we lived in the city and went skiing on the weekends and i'd ski i don't know eight eight maybe 10 days a year <clears throat> up at a little area called Alpental just outside of Seattle, which is a really good little hill. And then we, then we bought a cabin up at Crystal Mountain and uh, I skied there until I got into college and Crystal's an awesome hill. And um, I didn't realize how good it was until I started traveling. Sure. And then you realize, wow, this is, this is quite a hill. Yeah, that's, that's cool. I, th I feel like, I, you know, I, I opposite growing up in Maine is pretty much the opposite spot to Seattle, but I kind of feel the same way. Like looking back at the little resorts I grew up skiing as a kid, I now think like, oh, those are actually pretty cool. Yeah. Um, so were you, were, were you always kind of a weekend warrior up until those college days? Yeah. Until I, until I discovered you could take winter quarter off from college and then uh, it took me, you know, seven years to, to finish a four-year education if i was focused i'd be a surgeon now <laughs> well skiing's more fun um now were you a competitive mogul skier i know like from watching footage of you skiing in the past you were always referred to as like the mogul expert yeah i was i was you know i grew up skiing in the 70s and uh when I look back, there was no grooming that I can recall anywhere. And, and freestyle was at its height in the 70s. So sure. even if there was grooming, we wouldn't have been skiing there. We were skiing bumps. All, we ski bumps all the time. If it was a powder day, we'd ski powder bumps. If it was spring, it was slush bumps. Yeah. So, so yeah, I started competing – um, I guess I, mo I moved to Sun Valley when I was 19 and competed in the Intermountain Circuit and then moved to Squaw and then Colorado. So I moved around every winter yep. and, and always, always in search of better competition. Now, did you have like immediate success as a competitive mogul skier 
or was there was there a moment when you were like oh i'm like pretty good at this i think i could i could make something of this you know i was pretty good right away i was when i lived in sun valley i was the intermountain mogul champion and then went back home to the northwest and was pacific northwest mogul champion and then down to squaw and was far west mogul champion and then colorado for two years where i was runner up and so yeah i had i had good success from the start and continued to improve sure who was who was beating you down in colorado um the guy who won there was a guy named uh dogwood robert aguirre okay so, and uh and i actually think i would have got him there too but i went to to film with stump for part of those seasons and missed some competitions uh, okay that's a that's he was a, a good competitor and good friend well i mean go, i feel like going to film with stump is a pretty good excuse for not not winning <laughs> yeah yeah no those were those were good trips now speaking of stump and I'd obviously you know it'd be a pretty pointless interview if we didn't talk about that kind of stuff um how did you how did you meet greg stump and kind of how did that how did that relationship form like from the very beginning Oh, I met him because I was competing against his brother, Jeff, in okay. Colorado. So I, I met him, met him there just on the competition circuit. And, and, uh, and, I, and I, I don't know if Jeff said something to Greg or what, but he said, hey, you want to come shoot with us? And I actually turned him down because it was right before nationals. And my goal then was to, to get on the U.S. team. Yep. So, but after nationals, then, then I went on a, on a, a road trip with them. That was fun spring, super fun spring road trip. Um, when we shot time weights for snowman. Okay, cool. So that was your, that was your first filming trip with him. Yeah. What, uh, I feel I should know, but what year was that? 85. And then, so and then Blizzard of Oz would have been 88? Yes. Okay. Yes, because that because I had a, a, a spot on the U.S. team, but it had torn my ACL the year before, so I could I, – I had a spot to go back and compete. And, uh, and, and I thought, okay, I can go to Shawnee – it was stumped for two months and ski and make a little money and or I could go ski rock hard moguls with a with a with a fresh ACL and and cost a lot of money so I went you know what I'll go with stump and it turned out to be a good decision yeah that's interesting I feel like you know that's uh that's kind of a decision that the pro skiers are making again in 2020 you know I feel like there were some years in like the early 2000s when everybody was doing everything like going on film trips and competing and stuff like that but that's like kind of a uh like common theme in the freestyle world right now is whether you're gonna go the avenue of a competitive skier or the avenue of a film skier yeah and it seems like and this isn't universal but it seems like a lot of them started out on the competitive circuit yeah and then got noticed and then jumped over to a film career. Yeah. Uh, cool. Now let's talk about Blizzard of Oz for a little bit. Was that your first trip to Chamonix? Yeah. Yep. First trip to Chamonix. I, I was in uh, Europe uh, two years before when we shot Maltese Flamingo. Okay. Where, uh, to remind everyone, where was Maltese Flamingo filmed? That was in uh, Teen and uh, Teen and Les Arcs. Okay, so you had some experience with European terrain, um, but not specifically Sham. Yeah, and 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 Chamonix was a whole different animal for sure. Yeah, I mean, I've I've never been there personally. It's definitely a, a goal of mine to ski there someday. Um, but what was it like, kind of seeing that terrain for the first time? It was eye-opening and intimidating because like yeah. i said i was a i was a mogul skier yeah i'd never skied out of bounds um i'd never had a beacon on 
Yeah. And, and so to be dumped into Chamonix with the with the wild, you know, seracs and glaciers and big granite faces was was super intimidating and uh um but but alluring as well i was yeah. i was drawn to the terrain that that is eventually what led me to becoming a guide okay that trip yeah because i was drawn to that terrain but i also knew i had no business being out there on my own <laughs> yeah no you put a lot of trust in your guides for sure um which specifically your guide on this trip is is you know it's sort of infamous in the sense that he's kind of a big part of the story of blizzard of oz yeah uh, so what was what was murray ball like from your perspective yeah i mean Mur murray was classic he was uh super super mellow down to earth um and 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 honestly so he was at that time he was not an ifmga guide he was not okay. certified um and and i don't know stump uh, schmidt had a connection with him somehow and introduced him to to stump and and so he said yeah i can i'll i'll take you guys out but he was legally i don't believe he was should have been doing that and and so honestly with what little we knew about uh, that that big mountain terrain, we didn't know if he was safe or not. We were going right. on blind faith, and but in 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 retrospect, he is now an IFMGA guide, and and uh, he's very competent, and and he was he was a he was a perfect guy to show us around. Yeah. Now, if, in the film like um in stump's narration he's always talking or referring to him as like kind of a wild man which is always really interesting to me because like plake seems like the quintessential wild man so how are you gonna have another wild man that you're calling <laughs> out in the film as the wild man well and i think that's more that uh you know murray was taking us to places where it was crazy terrain in our world. I mean, Stump was like me. He was a resort skier. You yeah, know? He, and, Stump grew up in Maine. Yeah, ex exactly. So it, it, Murray took us to places that that seemed outrageous and wild, and 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 they were. Um, but as, especially for a bunch of kids that grew up skiing in the resorts in the U.S. Yeah, yeah. No, I can only. I can only imagine what that would have been like. Um, was there was there a certain moment or a certain experience in that trip that like sticks out to you or is most memorable for you? Boy, I, I mean that that whole trip was memorable. Um, from being lowered into Pubel Kuar, um, again, never never had a harness on in my life, never been on a rope, so that was wild. But but a lot of it was just the experience of being in France and, and, and some of the experiences were, were, were not skiing like uh, snowball fights. <laughs> it, it, you, you don't think about this, but being in a snowball fight in France, you feel like a major league pitcher because <laughs> they don't grow up playing baseball and <laughs> basketball and football. And I remember standing out there, firing snowballs at, and at, at these cowering French and they jump up and like throwing left-handed back at you, you know? So <laughs> if you ever want to feel like a superior athlete, go, go get in a snowball fight in Europe. I like it. It's like, uh, I'm so glad that was your answer. That's awesome. Um, I'm curious what, uh, what went through your head that moment when Plague fell and, and hit you? Uh, I mean, it, it happened so quick. I, I just, I didn't, I, of course, I didn't know what was happening behind me. And I just felt the pushing. And, and fortunately, my speed downhill was just slightly slower than his coming behind me. Yeah. So it didn't, it didn't knock me over. It yeah. was just a, a gentle push. And when I felt it, I just slid out of the way. But, yeah. 
but skiing that couloir for me was that was the first i didn't ski that kind of stuff so it was already a little nerve-wracking being in there yeah and uh and then to and then to have plate pushing on me from behind was <laughs> was a little unnerving yeah every time i see that footage i like every single time i watch that shot it's amazing how quickly it all happened and how quickly you guys were like just right back to skiing like it right could have, it could have gone so bad really easily yeah it could have but we we were lucky and, and you know the snow in there there was a fair amount of snow and it was soft yeah so yeah you would have tumbled, but it wouldn't have been wouldn't have been that bad i skied it a few times later and there's a rock band in there that's gnarly yep um that if there's not a lot of snow like there was when we skied it it's dangerous it was like a five minute sidestep through that thing with tips and tails balancing on rocks and skis bent and um and 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 what's interesting is one of those times i skied it i rolled over just like plague did because <laughs> it was it was pretty stiff kind of wind blown snow yeah, and kind of grabby and, yeah it was and, and not smooth and chunky and and anyways, I rolled over and, and was back on my feet, just like Blake was, right before that rock band. So, um, yeah, I had, that, one, that one scared me way more than, uh, than when Blake was pushing behind me. Yeah. <clears throat> no, that's true. It did, it, it did look like a lot of snow when you guys were skiing that. Yeah, well, it snowed. Like 10 feet or something? Yeah. A massive amount of snow i mean there were huge avalanches after that cycle yeah and 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 we skied that couloir poubelle um right after the snowfall so 10 feet of fresh snow on top of that thing yeah that's awesome um now coming from like specifically that kind of genre of skiing so to speak like the professional uh, it's safe to say that you were a professional big mountain skier right i think we can say that <laughs> i guess we were called extreme skiers back then well sure uh but you know coming... not that we ever not that we ever referred to ourselves as that but that's <laughs> that was the moniker at that time well i'm giving you that the title of former professional big mountain skier at least <laughs> uh so coming from that background and you know you've been in the industry ever since what's it like from your perspective watching like the latest generation of people skiing that terrain you know i'm thinking oh. like King, kings and queens of corbett's that competition <laughs> the way that candide skis the french terrain yeah i'm yeah, curious it's, what it's, that's like from your perspective it's uncomparable what what we were doing was like child's play compared to what's happening now the level is so high and the consequences are so much greater it's it's not even the same sport i mean it's 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 laughable to compare the two now. yeah well it's you you were the one that was breaking the ground for those today's athletes so to speak so i think that it's pretty cool to see the progression and and how you know, people watch, and I'm sure you are this same way. You watch what the generation before you did and think, how can I do that a little differently or a little bit better or go a little bigger, go a little faster. So it's, it's been interesting and really, really entertaining seeing the progression of big mountain or extreme skiing, in my opinion. Yeah. And, and that curve is just right. grown exponentially. Right. No, it's pretty darn cool. Um, back then you were cool if you could do a helicopter right <laughs> right now you got to do like switch double cork something something in the back country exactly. um, through your career has there been like a single person or maybe a, a few people that have kind of stuck out as your favorite people to ski with you know no there there hasn't been I mean uh, I can't, I can't, there's not one single person that, that sticks out over the years that's been like a, a, a go-to ski partner. Um, it's changed all the time and I've got to ski with some amazing people through my time in the industry and, and certainly early days at K2, 
Uh, I got to ski with the bears a lot, and not not that we were ski parks, but I got to test skis with them and them at yeah. K two events, and they were they were phenomenal to watch. Just that blend of of power and finesse was was really cool, and it didn't matter if it was hard snow or crud; those guys could ski everything. I mean, yeah. the mares. I remember skiing with them. They were skiing moguls and throwing helicopters in the bumps. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what about a, what about a, a most memorable moment from your ski career? Boy. I mean, I, I guess probably the most pivotal was, was just that chunk of time in Chamonix. Yeah. Just because it, uh, again, I went from a mogul skier who spent all his time skiing moguls to that was the first time where where I ever even skied on a GS ski and oh, and cool. and skied very little mogul skied steeps and crud and powder and and big wild mountain terrain that that uh I had never even even seen before or even thought about skiing so that was that was certainly the most pivotal time in my career from a, just from a skiing perspective yeah. Now, how did um, you mentioned your early days at K2? How did you kind of transition into into that role? Well, I, when I got back from shooting Blizzard of Oz, I still had a few college credits to finish. And I uh, so I finished those in summer school and got a job at K2. I started working in August. Like so it was a pretty, pretty quick transition. That's awesome. It happened yeah. happened pretty darn quick. Yeah. Uh, now I know you played a integral role in the development of the K two Extreme, right? Yeah. Yep. Uh, tell us a little bit about developing that ski and kind of how things have changed to where you are now. You've been with Fisher for three years, and I know personally from talking with you that you're very involved in the development of skis there so how kind of how has the development of skis changed from the late 80s to 2020 well it's interesting because that kind of bookends it that was the very first ski i'm quite certain that was developed by athletes that weren't racers or maybe freestyle skiers in the 70s um, and that ski was driven by um, Plake and Schmidt and I and Reichhelm. We were the ones that, that tested that ski. And, and, and we were trying to get a blend of, um, I, I mentioned GS skis was, was the first time I skied on in Shawnee. And we liked the stability of, of GS skis. But yeah. Plake and I especially were still skiing a lot of moguls. And anything that had metal in it, you'd bend. Right. So the idea was to build a, a, a ski with a deeper side cut than a traditional GS ski and, and take the metal out of it. So that's what it was. And, and, and coincidentally, that was the best selling ski in K2 history. Yeah, that was 20, a huge seller. 25,000 pairs or something like that. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So a lot, a lot of, a lot of skis in one model. So, but was what was interesting so comparing that to what's happening now back then the the shape was more or less defined okay we had a, a deeper side cut on this ski but even talk about side cuts what was fairly new there was two side cuts there was a slalom side cut and there was a gs side cut and that was yeah. it and so this was blending that and changing a little bit of the guts of the skis taking the metal out uh, but those were the only parameters that you had to play with now you've got width you've got rocker you've got taper and so you have so many more dimensions to play to play with that it gets quite a bit more complicated and and of course it, it's cool because you can go so many more directions too yeah and 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 that's been uh the fun part of of ski development over honestly over the last 20 years really has been we'll look back on this era and go that was the golden age of ski development because 
up until then, you know, the last however many, 20, 30 years, it was little tweaks in construction, but sidecut didn't change that much. And, right. and, and now everything, <clears throat> you have so many th different things to play with. You know, it went from, from, you know, narrow skis to you had big fat powder skis. And the first powder skis that Atomic developed, the bindings weren't mounted in the middle. They were mounted on the inside of the ski so you could get leverage over the edge. So it was all experimentation. And, and when you look at all the things that have come out of the last 20 years, you know, shape and side cut and width and rocker and taper. And it's, uh, you're never, I, I don't think you're ever going to see <clears throat> the, uh, the development like it was in the last, last 20 years. Yeah. And so for, at, at Fisher, it's been great because um, Fisher is obviously an Austrian company and has a huge, huge uh, depth of knowledge when it comes to ski development and, and building skis and construction and everything from Nordic skis to jumping skis to World Cup skis. And so it, it, it's great to have all that, those resources at your fingertips. and and. You know, depending on the product line, we have more or less involvement. Like the the Austrians aren't coming to coming to me and saying, "Mike, what 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 should we do for a race ski?" They got they got <laughs> plenty of World Cup guys and uh, people that can help them there. But but they recognize that that the free ride market <clears throat> really started in the U.S. and is driven by the U.S. So we have we have uh, we have the lead on that that group of skis. So um that's been fun it's 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 very much um like we're at the factory we're talking to the engineers and the product the product managers over there on a weekly basis trying to figure out where we want to go and what we want to do with the collection very cool yeah i think uh i, I it, it's got to be really cool for you to see but that's that's what i expected you to say is with today's skis there's so many different variables that there's almost like and there's endless combinations of, of these different variables. Like, and I think Fisher is one of the best examples because you guys do kind of think outside the box a little bit. Like the fact that like the carbon nose construction on those Ranger skis, it genuinely makes them feel a little bit different than if you were to make that exact same shape, but not have the carbon nose. So there's like, there's so many different things that go into it now. And I think it's really cool and ultimately it's something that i spend a lot of time thinking about in our you know product reviews and all that kind of stuff is just how many different design elements there are and how they how they change and how they affect performance it's pretty cool yeah it it, it really is and it's uh it's a much more complicated puzzle sure and 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 as a result you have a much bigger variety of skis out there right we got great. skis with a lot of rocker and a lot of taper that are super easy and swimmy and powder and right and and don't ski very well on hard snow and you know and and you can just position the ski as as precise as you want yeah no it's it's fascinating i could i i'm pretty sure that you and i could spend like hours talking about ski design so <laughs> we'll skip that for the sake of our audience. that for a beer another time <laughs> yeah um now, new skis are great, obviously. Do you ever take out your uh, straight skis just for fun? You know, I haven't, but I should do that just to just to humble myself. Yeah. Uh, Bob St. Pierre, I'm sure you've met Bob before. Um, he, he skis on a pair of straight skis like probably once a week in the winter. Really? Yeah. And it's, it's pretty cool. And uh, he pretty much likes to do it for that exact reason. He's like, I don't want to forget how to ski on these things. <laughs> uh, you know what? Each time we had a new development, I was a better skier. So yeah. I don't want to go back to being a worse skier. Yeah. I skied on straight skis for probably the first 12 or 13 years of my life or so. And yeah, I don't, I don't feel any desire to go back to that that challenge necessarily although i did find a pair of rosy 4s's at a at a garage sale this summer so i'll probably ski those at some point oh, nice. <clears throat> that was a hot ski 
Yeah, super hot. Maybe not as hot as the K2 Extreme, though. I don't think so. I, I, I don't know what their sales numbers were. They sold a lot of those, though. All right. So when I was planning this interview, I asked our staff if they had any questions for you. So oh. I'm going to finish with a few questions from our staff. One of them is from me. Um, feel free to not respond if you feel like your response is going to ruffle any feathers mostly just referring to this first question that i think is very fun to ask you uh who's the better skier uh glenn plake or scott schmidt <laughs> i think it depends on what you're what you're measuring them against that you know you could you could pick either one depending on 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 what the terrain is and you know i think schmidt is a is is probably a better technical skier i think plake sure. is uh, has got more backcountry and big mountain knowledge. Um, yeah, there. You know that 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 is a. Good, it's a pretty uh, good question and unanswerable at the same time because they're sure. you know they're different skiers and yeah. Well, I think that's what made I, I would have answered the exact same way. I haven't skied nearly as much with either of them as you have, but to me, they have different skiing styles. Um, and I think you you have a a third different skiing style, and I think that's right. kind of what made those movies so fun to watch. Is the three of you maybe didn't look at terrain differently, but you certainly like skied that terrain differently, which is just you yeah. know, one of my favorite things about skiing is you put your signature on the mountain. Right. Um, speaking of which, the there's a wind lip jump session in License to Thrill. Were you in that session? Do you remember what, do you know what I'm talking about? Oh. There's a big triple daffy in License to Thrill. Yeah, that was Jeff Stump, I think, that threw that. Okay. I was wondering who that was. I was wondering whether it was you or Jeff. No, I never did daffies. Maybe okay. a single. No. Um, <laughs> boy, I vaguely remember that. I don't think I was there that day. Okay. For some reason, because I... Because I, I don't recall going off that jump. It was a, it was a big wind lip. I remember huge, that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, huge. A lot of a lot of big hip check landings, which I'm sure a couple of them were pretty painful by how big that was. <laughs> uh, so this this next question came from Mike Adala. Um, how long did it take Glenn Plake to do his hair when you were in Chamonix? And did that get in the way of your filming schedules? <laughs> um, at, at that point, I was doing his hair. Oh, really? Um, yeah, he wasn't married yet. I was doing. <laughs> yeah, I was. I was his designated hairdresser. Um, and it would take, <clears throat> I don't know, ten or fifteen minutes. He That's would. Not... He would lay his head down on a on a table and we'd fan his hair out and you take a, a a spray bottle of Knox gelatin and and spray the spray his hair and then blow dry it till it was stiff and then he'd flip it over and then you, you do the other side <laughs> uh, that's great um and then i don't having i don't have a big telemark background uh, but Bob St. Pierre wanted to ask you just simply 75 millimeter or NTN? Oh, NTN. <laughs> no question. And then my last question for you, which is kind of uh, less silly than these last four. Uh, what are you most excited about for this upcoming ski season? You know, we're in kind of a weird situation right now in the whole world with COVID. Um, what are you personally looking forward to most about about ski season? Oh, um, you know, I'm I'm curious to see how it's all going to unfold. Absolutely. Um, and and I think I I think like most people, it's going to be a big backcountry year. Yep. Because uh, for two reasons, one. I'm I'm pretty sure all the resorts are going to open whether they can stay open or not i don't yeah. know i think they probably will but 
there's going to be a limited number of people there too. They're going to, I think most resorts are going to limit the number of, of skiers. Yep. And, uh, and I think the skiing experience might not, yeah, depending on how crowded it is. I mean, with social distancing every, and, and uphill capacities limited. So if you've got a tram and a, uh, or, or a gondola, those aren't going to be stuffed. Right. So, just that is going to make lines longer. And so I think some people are going to go, you know what, I, I'm going to, I'm going to, instead of skiing on this busy weekend, I'm going to go midweek or I'm going to go, I'm going to go tour on the weekend and maybe I'll ski midweek. Yeah. I think that's the other thing that we're going to see too, is there are a lot of people that are not on a normal work schedule. They're not going to the office on a regular basis. So maybe True. they can take off and ski on a Tuesday or Wednesday and work on the weekend. True. So, um, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm excited for all the normal things. I think, you know, I live in sun Valley and we don't have, we don't have a ton of people. We've been social distancing here since 1936 when they opened. <laughs> so even, even, uh, even over Christmas break, you don't, you don't wait in lift lines here. So sure. for us here, I don't think it's going to be that different. Good, good. Uh, and then, uh, where do you see kind of the the future of the ski industry? Do you have any any Mike Hatrup insights about where you think the industry is going to go? You know, not related to this just single upcoming season, just more in general, looking down the road. Oh boy, I, I think I think you're going to continue to see people get off the beaten track and explore more and more back country and side country. Yeah. I think you're um, right. just because I think for a number of reasons, I think one, the, the equipment has lent itself to be so much better. And, and, in the old days, I mean, the, you talked about Telmark earlier. The reason I learned to Telmark is so I could go touring. Right. And, and, uh, and that mindset, you know, nobody thought about, Alpine touring gear in the U.S. Sure, in Europe it was huge. Yeah, but in the U.S. the equipment was so inferior compared to what you were skiing on at the resort that it was like a different sport already. Yeah. So you might as well be making a telly turn because you weren't going to make that great an alpine turn on the gear you had. But equipment. but sure. now the gear is so good. Even the really lightweight stuff skis better than the old m medium weight touring gear of 20 years ago and you can get stuff that's maybe not that light but allows you to tour and ski you know every bit as strong as you do at the resort yeah so it's opened up the doors and, and of course skis have skis have made the biggest contribution and that you know before you had to have good snow if you were skiing a 204 slalom ski in the backcountry, and and now now make that snow heavy, and you had to be a really good skier. Yeah. And now you take that same heavy, thick snow and put on a pair of fat rocker skis, and it's a powder day. Right. You could put an intermediate out there on. So right. the skis have really opened up the doors as to who can go in the backcountry too. Yeah. Yeah, Fisher Rangers, they're they're great for that. Absolutely. Yeah, and then. And, and, and that's the kind of heavy metal touring that, that you can ski either at the resort on the same equipment that you can go walk in. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it's, it's pretty cool. The, the, uh, the equipment that's available to skiers these days is pretty darn awesome. That's for sure. Uh, well, Mike, I want to thank you a lot. That was great. That's, that's all the questions I have for you. So I'll, I'll let you get back to whatever you're doing over there in Idaho. Um, I guess, do you have any, anything that you want to share with our audience, any news from Fisher or yourself or anything that you just want to leave people with? Um, ah, we've got some, yeah, I'll hold off. We got some new products that are going to be super fun. We got a new touring boot that'll be out cool. um, this winter. Cool. It's so going to some be things really cool that I'm looking forward to because we've had a really light boot in the Traverse and then uh, 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 the Ranger, which is the heavy metal touring high performance, and we've got a boot that'll be right down the middle there. Sweet. Which is really cool. So excited for that. And 
and we're working on uh, new rangers already but Sweet. that's that's over a year out so. so some some stuff to look forward to down the road oh yeah awesome well mike i, I really appreciate it i think this was a lot of fun or a lot of fun for me hopefully our, our audience liked it too um keep uh keep healing and take care of yourself i will thanks for having me yeah of course anytime and uh, i'll take you up on that beer and we'll talk about skis next time i see you that sounds good it might be more than one i that's fine with me <laughs> thanks mike see you later sweet